Hi, I'm Frank Spear. I want to welcome you to this blog. This is actually the first of a two-part series that I'd like to talk to you about recession and restorative dentistry. You know, I'm sure all of us have had the frustration of seeing a patient where suddenly the margins that were originally subgingival end up exposed and the patient's now unhappy. Now, this particular example isn't one of mine. This is a patient who came in to me um, who had just had these crowns placed six months earlier and is now quite upset by it. But certainly I've seen margins of my own exposed through the years. What I'd like to do in this two-part series is gives you, gives you some th thoughts about why recession occurs and when it's very unlikely to occur. And then in part two, if it is likely, what are the things we can do to help prevent this from happening? First of all, it's important to realize there's a lot of things that go into the concept of when gingiva will recede or not. Most important of all is bone levels. If the bone is there, the tissue certainly can't recede into bone. We also have variations in patients, so-called biotypes, where we have thick gingiva and thin gingiva. We know the thicker the gingiva is much less likely to recede than thin gingiva is. We also have to understand that the tooth position within the alveolar housing has a big impact. The more labially positioned the tooth, the more likely there's a dehiscence, the thinner the tissue. The more lingual the tooth, the thicker the bone, less likely the dehiscence, less likely recession. And then finally, root form has a big impact because if you have large roots and very slender alveolus, which some people do, you're just very susceptible to recession. Now the bottom line for myself, the thing I tend to use the most to help me predict what's going to happen is actually sulcus depth. So I'd like to explain that to you. If we go back and we think about classic biology, most of us got it by sometime reading um, from a classic paper Garjula, Wentz, and Orban wrote back in 1961. They looked at human periodontium and the attachment of how the gingiva was attached to the tooth above the crest of bone. And they identified the fact that the average person has a connective tissue attachment of one millimeter in height, that the epithelial attachment is one millimeter in height. In 1962, D. Walter Cohen called these two things, epithelial attachment, connective tissue attachment combined, the biologic width. And we know the body won't recede into the biologic width. When tissue recedes, what recedes is above coronal to the biologic width. And so the typical person has about a millimeter sulcus. And what Garjula, Wentz, and Orban said is the average person has about three millimeters of total gingiva above bone. If that's your patient, recession is not going to occur. Or if it does occur, it will be very temporary and the tissue will actually grow back. Even if you were to cut the tissue off to bone, the body's going to regrow the connective tissue, regrow the epithelium, and regrow a sulcus. Now, there are some patients that are at higher risk of recession than others. A person like this diagram who has five millimeters of tissue above bone, but there's a three millimeter deep sulcus, that patient is at risk of recession. Now, that won't recede to the bone. It'll recede and stop perhaps at a one or two millimeter sulcus. But the deeper the sulcus and the thinner the tissue, the harder it is to maintain tissue height. Patients that are at lower risk of recession, even though they might have more tissue above bone, we know there's variations in biologic width, and a patient with only a millimeter sulcus is much less likely to get recession than a patient that actually has that three millimeter sulcus. Now, obviously biotype does play a role here. The thicker the tissue, the more palatal the tooth is in the alveolus, the less likely the recession is to occur. And so what I thought I would do is share with you an example of how gingiva does respond in patients by using this particular dentist who is part of our faculty club and was in orthodontics when she went through some of our workshops. She's unhappy with the gingival level on her left central and asked me if I could take a look at it. Well, when you start noticing that the left central is significantly coronal to the right central, you probe the right central, it probes about one and a half millimeters, the left probe's about three. This is kind of a perfect patient to do a gingivectomy on, where you could excise a millimeter and a half of tissue to make the tissue heights even and not have to remove bone in the process. The critical question is, why is the left central three millimeters deep and the other one's only one and a half? And it actually has to do with the fact that the root is more to the lingual in that left central. So this is actually 
some video of doing the gingivectomy. Here's probing the right central. Probe's about one and a half. It's anesthetized. I push to bone, so-called sounding. It has a sounding depth of about three millimeters, kind of normal, just like Gargiulo Wentz and Orban's diagram. Now we go over to our left central. We probe the sulcus. It probes about three. We push all the way to bone and it goes close to five millimeters. And so really we should be able to easily take off a millimeter, millimeter and a half to get this tissue level and not worry about much recession because this tissue is already kind of thick tissue because the tooth is to the lingual. So we're marking where the tissue should go. These days, if I was doing this exact same thing, I'd probably be doing it with a laser. But honestly, whether you use a laser or an electrosurge or a scalpel or a diamond really doesn't matter. In this instance, I used an electrosurge. And part of why I'm choosing this one is I'll hear people say, well, electrosurges cause recession. No, biology causes recession. Deep sulcuses cause recession. The electrosurge doesn't induce recession. The electrosurge simply trims away the excess tissue. If it's a deep sulcus and it's thin tissue, you might get some recession. Now, in reality, what's most likely going to happen to this one? It's going to grow back. Not where it started. But when you have a patient with a tooth more to the lingual and thicker tissue and a deep sulcus like this, it's probably going to grow back some. So we end up getting the tissue leveled out on both centrals, just cleaning it up with a little peroxide. And we're left with about a millimeter and a quarter sulcus on the left one and pretty close to what we had on the right. So now you can see the change in gingival levels from where we started to what she looks like following the gingivectomy. There was our three millimeter sulcus pre-treatment. Here is about our one and a quarter millimeter sulcus post-treatment, one and a half. So we've trimmed away about a millimeter and a half of tissue. The big question is what happens? What happens to this tissue? Well, in fact, it does what most gingivectomies do. 12 months later, it has grown back about a half millimeter. So if you look at where we left it and where it is now, it actually has moved coronally. And I'm showing you this so that you understand it's the biology that determines whether we get recession or not. If we have bone, if we have attachment height, and we have some tissue thickness, you're not going to get the body to have less than a millimeter sulcus. And so the sulcuses you worry about are deeper than that. Now in this particular one, it certainly didn't rebound to where it started, but it definitely rebounded about a half millimeter. So, as I said, my goal in part one was to have you think about recession relative to the biology of the system. And the biology is you can't get recession if you have bone and attachment there. You'll always maintain at least a millimeter sulcus unless you really have ultra thin tissue. Part two, we'll talk about what this means clinically if you're a restorative dentist. So I've enjoyed sharing this with you and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next segment.